Arguably the oldest polar mythology is that of Atlas, the king of Atlantis, who held the entire world upon his shoulders. Atlas had seven daughters, the Hesperides, who spent their days dancing around the tree of life. Also coiled around the tree, and guarding its golden apples of immortality, lived the serpent Ladon. The kingdom of Atlantis was shaped as concentric circles of land separated by concentric circles of water, with the Temple of Poseidon residing in the very center where sacred bulls roamed around freely, and sacrificial bull's blood was poured over the exterior of the temple. The actual medical term for the topmost thirty-third vertebrae of the spine, which holds up the human skull, is the atlas. So when it is said that atlas metaphorically holds the world upon his shoulders, it is literally your head and mind which he holds up. Likewise, the temple of Poseidon exists between your temples on the sides of your head, and your skull, when viewed from above, perfectly resembles Atlantis, or a bull's eye. Why would the center of a target be called a bull's eye anyway? The bull's eye at the center is your third eye, the pineal gland, located at the geometric center point of the human brain, and which roams around freely in a chamber of cerebrospinal fluid. This is surrounded by the cerebral cortex, which itself is covered by a layer of constantly flowing and pumping sacrificial bull's blood, and enclosed by the skull cap, three concentric circles of solid separated by two concentric circles of liquid. The microcosmic tree of life is our cerebrospinal system, with its multitudinous branching nerve ganglia. The seven Hesperides, who dance around and guard the tree of life, are the seven chakras, seven energy centers along the spinal column where key organs exist, namely the cerebrum, the pineal gland, the throat, the heart, the navel, the sacrum, and the perineum. Lastly, the serpent laid on, coiled around the tree of life, is the transformative kundalini serpent energy, which lies coiled at the base of the spine, trapped by our fused lower vertebrae. Dr. William Warren wrote, Science has now discovered, in a most unexpected manner, both the tree and the river of life. The former is the brain and spinal cord of man. We do not mean that the brain merely looks like a tree or resembles one externally. We are not dealing with analogies, but we do mean that the brain and spinal cord are an actual tree. By the most rigid scientific examination, it is shown to fill the ideal type and plan of a tree more completely than any tree of the vegetable kingdom. The spinal cord is the trunk of this great tree. Its roots are the nerves of feeling and motion branching out over the body. The tree of life is planted in the midst of many others, for the heart is a tree, the lungs are a tree, and the pancreas, stomach, liver, and all those vital organs. The brain is its radiant and graceful foliage. The mental faculties are classified in twelve groups by the most recent scientific analysis. This tree bears twelve kinds of fruit. On each side of the tree of life is the great river of life. Let us lay a man down with his head to the north and his arms stretched to the west and to the east. The river of life has its four heads in the four chambers of the heart, the two oracles and the two ventricles. The branches of this river pass upward to the head, the land of gold, eastward to the left and westward to the right, arm and lung. But greatest of all the branches, the river, or frath, are the aorta and the vena cava, reaching southward to the trunk and lower limbs. In branching over the body, this river divides into four parts at seventeen different points. Two branches of the river form a network around the very trunk of the tree and spread upward among its expanding branches. The blood is the water of life, and it looks as clear as crystal when seen through the microscope, the eye of science. It is three-fourths water, and through this are diffused the red cells and the living materials which are to construct and to maintain the bodily organs. Now before thinking this some new age nonsense or spiritual woo-woo without basis in physical reality, remember these allegories are actually ancient, several millennia old, and meant to encode yogic wisdom. 
as shown in my book The Atlantean Conspiracy, cultures as diverse and separated as the Indian and Mayan civilizations shared these identical mythologies since long before Columbus. Shakla, in Mayan, refers to the body's energy centers, exactly like the Indian chakra system. Kultanlunni, in Mayan, refers to the power of God within man, controlled by the breath, just as the Indian yogis claim of Kundalini. And Yokha, in Mayan, means on top of truth, just as the word yoga means in ancient Sanskrit. Furthermore, Atal, in Sanskrit, means to support or uphold, as Atlas was said to support and uphold the world on his shoulders. And in Mayan, Atal is found in the names of most of their gods, with one of its meanings being the top of the head. Suffice to say, these are archaic, long-known concepts, and not some New Age fad. Consider the caduceus symbol found on all hospitals and medical establishments. What does this represent, and why is it so revered in medicine? The symbol shows an upright staff being climbed and intertwined by twin serpents, topped with a ball and sprouting wings. You would be forgiven for confusion over why such a symbol has anything to do with the medical field. Like the tree of life in the Atlantean myth, the staff of the caduceus represents the human spine. Just as the serpent laid on lived coiled in the tree of life, the twin snakes coiling up the caduceus represent kundalini energy rising up the spinal column. The points where the two snakes intersect represent the lower chakras, and the ball sprouting wings represents the highest crown chakra. This symbolism is also found in ancient Egypt, where pharaohs would carry a tall staff while wearing cobra headdresses featuring a snake and or bird coming out from their third eye. Again, the staff represents the human cerebrospinal system, the snake represents kundalini, and the third eye is one of our seven chakras. The wings of the caduceus, or the bird's head on the pharaoh's headdress, represent enlightenment, risen kundalini, an open third eye, and an illuminated crown chakra. The Egyptian mystery schools were actually centers of initiation for this arcane knowledge. Jerry Ann Lenhart wrote, Mythology often appears to be describing body sensations when it speaks of serpents, as well as describing the human spine, which can be symbolized as the tree, or twin trees, or the serpent, or twin serpents. The serpent image connected with the spine has its best-known representation in the Indian Kundalini mythology. Chetwind describes body symbolism that is related to the serpent as connected with the spinal column, which joins the physical nature, the genitals, to the spiritual nature, the head. Unbeknownst to most Christians, these symbols and allegories were all expertly encoded into the Bible as well and not just the obvious serpent on the tree of knowledge in the Garden of Eden. For example, in Exodus, Moses and Aaron are brought before the Egyptian pharaoh, and by a miracle, Aaron's wooden staff magically transforms into a living snake. Exodus 7.10 reads, Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh, and before his servants it became a serpent. Aaron's rod is his spine, and the serpent is Kundalini. The actual Egyptian pharaohs would have been well aware of the symbolism conveyed here, as they traditionally wore cobra headdresses and carried such staffs and scepters themselves. Later in the Bible, Aaron is again used in a passage encoding this symbolism. Numbers 8.2 reads, Speak to Aaron, and say unto him, When thou lightest the lamps, the seven lamps shall give light over against the candlestick. The candlestick is your spine, and the seven lamps are your seven chakras. The word chakra literally translates to wheel of light. Similarly, Revelation 5.1 reads, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. Again, just like what is found within and on your backside, your spine, sealed with seven chakras. This analogy is even more explicitly stated in the books of Matthew and Genesis. In Matthew 6.22, Jesus says, The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, 
thy whole body shall be full of light. Genesis 32.30 states that Jacob called the place Pineal, saying, It is because I saw God face to face. In other words, Jesus and Jacob are referring to the pineal gland, the third eye, or single eye meditation point, which lies at the geometric center of our brains. When you slow your brain waves through meditation, sensory deprivation, entheogens, fasting, or other methods, your usually overactive left brain eases off, allowing easier access to the higher, holistic right brain and through to the pineal gland, which the Bible calls the dwelling place of God, and Descartes called the seat of the soul. Here where I live in Thailand, Buddha is their Jesus, and many believe he performed several similar literal miracles as Jesus, like walking on water, over 500 years prior. Buddha was said to have been born and instantly began walking, taking seven steps forward. After each step, a lotus flower appearing on the ground under his feet. Upon completing his seventh step, Buddha stopped and shouted, I am chief of the world. Now, of course, newborn babies cannot talk or walk fresh out of the womb, and lotus flowers cannot magically blossom under one's feet. But we were never meant to take such spiritual scriptures literally. In Eastern mysticism, for many thousands of years, the seven chakras have been symbolized by lotus blossoms, and so this story represents the metaphorical birth of an enlightened being whose seven chakras are illuminated. This Buddhist second birth is analogous to the Christian baptismal concept of being born again. In another tale, Buddha was meditating under a Bodhi tree when it began to rain heavily. From behind him, a huge king cobra came and coiled his body seven times around Buddha's body to keep him warm, and placed his hood over Buddha's head to protect him from the rain. After seven days, the rain stopped and the snake turned into a young man, who thereafter became one of Buddha's followers. Here again, we have the sacred tree, the serpent coming from behind, and then coiling up the back of the meditator seven times for seven days. The reason this story intentionally uses the number seven, both for how many times the cobra coils around Buddha, and for how many days he protects him, is to esoterically reference the seven chakras, which the kundalini serpent climbs and illuminates. The number seven actually appears an incredible 735 times in the Bible, more than any other number. In Revelations alone, there are 54 sevens, including the seven seals, seven churches, seven trumpets, seven personages, seven vials, seven woes, seven angels, seven thunders, seven plagues, seven glories, and seven blessings. There are the seven deadly sins, the seven days of creation, seven circles around the wall of Jericho, seven years building the temple of Solomon. Again and again the number seven is given incredible significance over any other number in the Bible. Christians say the number seven denotes spiritual perfection and divine fullness, completeness, totality, which is correct. But what is the origin of this numerology, and could that provide more insight into a deeper meaning? It is the same as Atlas's seven daughters dancing around the tree of life. It is the same reason seven lotus blossoms appeared under Buddha's feet, and a snake wrapped around him seven times for seven days. After the seventh day of creation, Genesis states God had a millennial rest period of a thousand years, because the seventh crown chakra is known as the thousand-petaled lotus. The lower five chakras, illustrated with four, six, ten, twelve, and sixteen petals, add up to forty-eight. The sixth chakra, illustrated with two petals, was known as the ninety-six petaled lotus, because it was said to be twice as powerful as the lower chakras, which adds up to one forty-four, and when multiplied by the thousand petal crown, gives the esoteric biblical number one hundred and forty-four thousand, which in the book of Revelations is the number of lucky Christians allowed into heaven along with Jesus Christ after the rapture. These myths long predated the Bible and were purposely encoded as symbolic keys to spiritual enlightenment. They were never meant to be read literally or historically. 2 Corinthians 3.6 clearly says the scriptures should not be read literally. Matthew 13.34 says Jesus never spoke unless it was in parables. He said, people who took the word literally 
were like those who looked but could not see. Modern fundamentalist Christians who read the Bible literally with their overactive left brains are missing the whole point. The reason Jesus cast nets to the right side, sits on the right side of God, and builds the door to the temple on the right side, is because he is leading us out of our carnal, lower left brains and into our higher, holistic brains on the right. This is what the exodus of slaves out of Lower Egypt is all about, a manual for spiritual enlightenment, not a literal slave revolt. There is no history of 600,000 slaves leaving Egypt for Israel because it never happened, and Israel never used to be an actual place. It was just three names of Egyptian gods, Isis, Ra, Elohim, shortened to Is, Ra, El. The real promised land Moses spoke of exists between your ears. Acts 7.48 says, The Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands. The only temples not built by human hands are the two temples behind your eyes, in front of your ears. As asked in 1 Corinthians 3.16, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? The Bible is teaching through a series of stories how to be Christ-like, how to live one's life in a divine manner, and ultimately, how to achieve Christ consciousness. Similarly, in Hinduism, the Vedas teach of Krishna, an avatar of their god, and by internalizing and meditating on the stories within, the devout disciple begins to develop Krishna consciousness. In Buddhism, Buddha's personal mission and that of all Buddhist practitioners is to achieve the highest state of human consciousness, which they call samadhi, nirvana, or enlightenment. These ancient religious scriptures personified gods to teach important lessons by analogy, exoterically presented as literal historical people, places, and events, but esoterically encoding symbolism, numerology, and allegories which reveal the original, true, and intended purpose of the scriptures. It was the same since the first Egyptian mystery schools up to the Masonic secret societies of today. The doctrine is presented exoterically in stories which can be read and understood on one level by the uninitiated masses, meanwhile esoterically encoding the deeper meanings which will only be recognized and learned by the initiated few. The reason Freemasons have 33 degrees is the same reason Jesus is said to have lived 33 years and performed 33 miracles. It is the same reason the first Temple of Solomon stood pristine for 33 years, and King Solomon had 3,300 officers. It is why King David reigned in Jerusalem for 33 years, and why the Seal of Solomon, or Star of David, is two intersecting triangles, two threes, or 33. It is the reason Jacob and Leah had 33 children, why in Leviticus 12.4, there were 33 days of purification, and in Genesis 46.15, there were 33 sons and daughters of Israel. It is the same reason why Kabbalah, the Jewish mystical system from which masonry's signs and symbols were derived, has exactly 33 elements in its tree of life, and the same reason why Atlas is your 33rd vertebrae. One of the earliest sects of Christianity, known as the Essenes, taught a system known as the 33 Nazareth Degrees of Enlightenment, whereby initiates underwent a series of ascetic austerities to attain spiritual gnosis. Included in their program was a vegan diet and regular fasting, two things also found in the Indian system of Kundalini Yoga. Associating one degree per vertebrae of the spine, the initiate raises the Kundalini serpent up the 33 permutations of the Tree of Life, and opens the seven seals. This is why the 33rd degree Freemasons revere the letter G, the seventh letter of the alphabet, and hold it sacred above all others, associating it with God and Gnosis, the G even representing a spiral like coiled kundalini. A thorough investigation into numerology shows this esoteric system of spiritual initiation was nearly ubiquitous in bygone times. In ancient Vedic temple architecture, a sacred post was always placed between the sanctum sanctorum and the main altar made of a special type of wood covered with brass and having 33 rings around it. These represented the upright human spine 
and its thirty-three vertebrae, or as the Rig Veda calls the thirty-three divinities. In Zoroastrianism, Ahura Mazda created the universe with the power of Yazashni, using thirty-three steps. In Buddhism, according to the Lotus Sutra, Canon Bodhisattva has thirty-three transformations in order to perform his task of salvation. In Islam, thirty-three angels carry the praise of man to heaven, and of the ninety-nine beautiful names of Allah, number thirty-three is Al-Azim, the supreme glory, the most grand. Ayacucha Huamanga, the religious capital of Peru, in the heart of the Andes, is known as the city of the thirty-three churches. During the Ming dynasty, in 1413, Emperor Zhu Di had thirty-three Taoist temples built on the Chinese holy mountain Wudang. The Basilica of St. Peter in Rome has exactly thirty-three chapels, and the Vatican has thirty-two archways on each side of the courtyard with a giant obelisk in the middle, and the Pope's cassock has thirty-two buttons, with his head representing the thirty-third. This is why the United Nations symbol is divided into thirty-three sections, why their general assembly room has exactly thirty-three lights, and why on 3303 the UN World Prayer Center called for everyone on earth to pray simultaneously at 3.30 p.m. It is even why in the system of Fahrenheit measurement, 33 is the first degree of temperature in which solid ice melts and liquid water is able to flow freely, like the 33rd degree free masons. Kundalini is represented by the serpent, an animal without legs, condemned to a life of slithering with its belly on the ground. An illuminated crown chakra, on the other hand, is often represented by a winged orb, as in the caduceus, a large bird, or a mythical half-bird, half-man able to fly. Both the serpent and bird are found in many mythologies, often depicted fighting one another, symbolizing the internal struggle within man to raise out of our lower nature and into higher consciousness. For example, Amazonian tribes speak of a central world tree inhabited by a large harpy eagle who is the enemy of giant serpentine beings connected with the underworld. In one story, their human hero takes feathers from the eagle and sticks them on his arms so that he can fly and steal life-saving medicine from the poisonous underworld serpents. Upon his success, the hero himself then transforms into a bird. In the Indian Puranas, there are fourteen worlds, divided into seven underworlds and seven overworlds. The Nagas are intelligent, poisonous, angry, serpentine beings who live in the lowest of the seven underworlds. Their sworn enemy is Garuda, a golden-bodied, half-bird, half-man hero who lives atop a gigantic Siba tree in the overworld. Similar to the Amazonian hero, in one story, Garuda steals the nectar of immortality from the Nagas, later destroying and eating them all. In Mongolian legend, the evil underworld snake Losi attempted to squirt poison from its fangs to end all life on earth. The human hero Otshirvani tried to kill Losi and failed, but then ascended Sumer Mountain, where he transformed into the birdman Garid. He was then able to catch Losi, wrap him three times around the mountain, crush his head, and kill him. In the Norse Eddas, the Midgard serpent lies in the midst of the ocean encompassing all the land and bites upon his own tail, while the gold-feathered bird Vidofnir sits perched on the topmost bough of the central world Yggdrasil tree. In their legend, the hero Odin sacrifices himself upon the Yggdrasil tree and gains many supernatural powers, including the ability to transform into any animal from lowly slithering snakes to high-flying birds. Native American totem poles are another example of this ancient spiritual symbolism. These tall pillars depicted characters from their various mythologies stacked vertically upon each other, usually seven in number, and topped with a winged bird. The Native American chief's feathered headdress echoes this too by specifically using bird feathers to represent the illuminated crown chakra. In these ancient cosmological stories, the microcosm is always merged with the macrocosm. The macrocosmic tree of life at the North Pole center of the world is analogous to the microcosmic branching cerebrospinal system at the center of our bodies. The world-engirdling serpent 
circling the outermost perimeter of the macrocosm, is analogous to the coiled kundalini around our lowermost chakra in the microcosm. And the heroic golden bird perched atop the central pillar of the macrocosm is analogous to the microcosmic illuminated crown chakra of an enlightened human being. So we ourselves are Atlas, king of our own microcosmic Atlantis, perched atop the 33rd vertebrae, with our seven daughters dancing around the tree of life, and the serpent laid on lying in wait. This is the microcosmic metaphorical Atlantis within us all. The macroscopic literal Atlantis, however, is our entire flat earth itself. The North Pole is the center point of Flatlantis, with its surrounding land masses separated by the Arctic Ocean, making the first concentric circles of land and water. The second giant landmass consists of all six inhabited continents, separated again by the southern oceans, giving a second ring of land and water. Then the mountainous circumferential Antarctic region, and whatever potentially exists beyond, make for three concentric circles. This is why a collection of terrestrial maps is called an atlas. Famous cartographer Gerardus Mercator actually coined the term himself in the 16th century when he published his work in honor of the mythological titan. As if by divine synchronicity, or perhaps his own embellishment, just as Atlas is our 33rd vertebrae, Mercator's North Pole map claims the central Rupus Nigra Sumeru Mountain happens to be exactly 33 miles in circumference. Another interesting note is that Atlas holding the world upon his shoulders is actually a complete misconception. Both in famous sculptures and the original stories, Atlas was never holding up a globular earth from underneath. Atlas holds up the heavens while standing on earth, and the globe upon his shoulders is the celestial sphere, otherwise known as the firmament. As the story goes, according to Ovid, Perseus traveled to Atlas's kingdom, declaring himself a son of Zeus and requested shelter. Atlas cautiously refused, fearing a prophecy that had warned a son of Zeus would one day steal the golden apples of immortality from his garden. Feeling slighted, Perseus turned the titan into a mountain range, with Atlas's head as the peak, his shoulders the ridges, and his hair the forests. It turns out the prophecy had nothing to do with Perseus, however, and it would be another son of Zeus, Heracles, Perseus's great-grandson, who would steal Atlas's golden apples of immortality. One of Heracles' twelve labors was to fetch the golden apples tended by the Hesperides and guarded by the serpent Ladon. Heracles approached Atlas and offered to hold up the heavens himself while Atlas retrieved the apples from his daughters. Little did Heracles know, anyone who voluntarily accepted the burden was doomed to carry the heavens on their shoulders themselves forever, or until someone else came along. Sensing something amiss with Atlas's eagerness to help, Heracles began suspecting he may have been tricked, and upon Atlas's return with the apples, hatched a new plan. He nonchalantly asked that Atlas quickly help hold the sky again for a moment while he rearranged his cloak to use as padding for his shoulders. Once Atlas set the apples down and picked the heavens up, Heracles swiftly snatched the apples for himself and ran away. In another version of the story, rather than trick Atlas, Heracles instead built two great pillars to uphold the sky and freed Atlas from his burden. Dr. William Warren wrote, we have elsewhere shown that in oldest Greek thought, Atlas belongs at the North Pole, and it is only reasonable to locate the kingdom of Atlas in the same locality. Secondly, some authorities have unconsciously placed Atlantis in just this polar position by identifying its inhabitants with the Hyperboreans. Thirdly, Apollodorus and Theopompus expressly call the lost land Meropia and its inhabitants Meropes i.e., according to the above authorities, issued from Meru. Atlas's pillar, then, is the axis of the world. It is the same pillar apostrophized in the Egyptian document known as the Great Harris Magic Papyrus, in these unmistakable words, O long column, which commences in the upper and in the lower heavens, it is with scarce a doubt what the same ancient people in their Book of the Dead so happily styled the spine of the earth. It is the umbrella staff of the Burmese cosmology, the churning stick of India's gods and demons. It is the trunk of every cosmical tree. 
It is the shadowless lance of Alexander, the tortoise-piercing, earth-piercing arrow of the Mongolian heaven god, the spear of Izanagi, the hacha de cabre on which the heavens of the Miztex rested. It is the cord which the ancient Vedic bard saw stretched from one extremity of the universe to the other. Is it not the psalmist's line of the heavens which is gone out through the very earth and on to the end of the world? It is the Ermensil of the Germans, as expressly recognized by Grimm. It is the Tower of Kronos. It is Plato's spindle of necessity. It is the Azakol of the North African Sunnis. It is the ladder with seven lamps in the rites of Mithra. It is the Talmudic pillar which connects the paradise celestial and the paradise terrestrial. In the Egyptian version of this mythology, the Atlas character is named Shu, and his son and daughter were named Jeb and Nut, the god of earth and goddess of the sky. Since childhood, Jeb and Nut were inseparable, spending all their time together, and developed an incestuous relationship. Resolving to put an end to this, Shu caught them in the act and stood between the two forever separating them. This act, in turn, created duality in the manifest world, above and below, dark and light, good and evil. Many other mythological figures have also historically been represented this way, with their feet touching the earth and their head or hands holding up the heavens. For example, the Samoan god, Te'iti, was said to push up the heavens, causing footholds six feet deep into the rocks. The Finnish god Ukko was also tasked with holding up the firmament. The angel Sandalphon from the Jewish Mishnah, according to Rabbi Eliezer, standeth on earth and reacheth with his head to the door of heaven. The god Indra from the Rig Veda, the supporter and sustainer of the world, who has upheld the earth and heaven and the firmament, is another version of this myth. Richard Thompson wrote, Thus the vertical axis of the universe is made to correspond to the personal form of the Lord. An analogy is sometimes made between this axis, with its graded series of heavens, and the spinal chakras on which yogis meditate. In this analogy, Bhumandala corresponds to the lowest chakra, and Satyaloka corresponds to the thousand-petaled Brahmarandra at the top of the head. The lower worlds corresponding to the legs of the universal form do not play a role in this analogy, but the serpent Anantasesa may correspond to the Kundalini at the base of the spine. In his essay on Indian cartography, Joseph Schwartzberg described one way in which the analogy between the spine and the cosmic axis is used in the process of meditation. By contemplating this analogy, meditators further the process by which one's self becomes a microcosm that fuses and becomes one with the enveloping macrocosm. One's spine then becomes the meru, or axis mundi, of both. Arrayed along the spine are various centers of psychic energy that one summons up in the practice of yoga in moving toward the supremely illuminated samadhi state. These energy centers may be viewed as the psychophysiological analogs of the heavens that the soul transverses on its path to ultimate liberation. In the microcosm, the Atlantean pillar is your spine, whereas in the macrocosm, it is the axis mundi, the invisible vertical line from the North Pole to Polaris. In the microcosm, the seven Hesperides are your chakras, dancing around your spine all day, whereas in the macrocosm, they are the seven stars of the Great Bear, the closest constellation to Polaris, encircling it every night. In the microcosm, the serpent is Kundalini, whereas in the macrocosm, it is the serpent's constellation, with its head separated from its tail, thanks to Garuda, Garide, and the other celestial birdman heroes. In all these cosmological conceptions, the Axis Mundi is personified as a god or poetically described as a majestic pillar, a world tree, or a gigantic mountain range, supporting the heavens and establishing the pivot on which they revolve. In ancient Sanskrit yogic texts, the spine is actually called Meru Danda, which shows the purposefulness of this analogy. A literal mountain, tree, pillar, or abode of gods may or may not actually exist at the center of earth, but the spiritual allegory was somehow ubiquitous in bygone times, even amongst supposedly uncontacted civilizations. Likewise, whether or not a literal worldwide flood 
ever once occurred destroying Flatlantis, a metaphorical flood of amnesia, has all but eliminated humanity's knowledge of these once universally known subjects like Kundalini and Flat Earth.